campaigns will have poll watchers and poll wor workers and observers in the polling place. And so campaigns will talk uh, to those people if they saw any irregularities that could cause problems in the election. Now, the Trump campaign talked pre-election about having 50,000 poll workers. So presumably, they did have eyes on the ground in all these places. And so in the normal course of things, a campaign will analyze the reports that come in. Trump campaign had a couple of basic problems, however. Number one, the 2020 election was not close. In 2000, that was 537 and close. In this election, the most narrow margin was 10,000 and something in, in Arizona. And you just don't make up that, those sorts of numbers in recounts. And when the claims of fraud and irregularities uh, were made, you've heard very compelling testimony from Mr. Stepien, from Matt Morgan, from Alex Cannon about those claims and how uh, they didn't believe them. And so that put the Trump campaign on sort of a process of bringing cases without the actual evidence that you have to have in which the process is designed to bring out. So are you aware of any instance in which a court found the Trump campaign's fraud claims to be credible? No, there was, there was never that instance uh, in all the cases that were brought, and I've looked at the more than 60 that include more than 180 counts. And no, the simple fact is that the Trump campaign did not make its case. The Select Committee has identified 62 post-election lawsuits filed by the Trump campaign and his allies between November 4th, 2020 and January 6th, 2021. Those cases resulted in 61 losses and only a single victory, which actually didn't affect the outcome for either candidate. Despite those 61 losses, President Trump and his allies claim that the courts refused to hear them out. And as a result, they never had their day in court. Mr. Ginsburg, what do you say about the claims that Mr. Trump wasn't given an opportunity to provide the evidence they had of voter fraud? Did they ha in fact, did they have their day in court? They did have their day in court. About half of those cases that you mentioned were dismissed at the procedural stage uh, for a lack of standing, the proper people didn't bring the case, or there wasn't sufficient evidence and it got uh, dismissed on a motion to dismiss. But in the other, there was discussion of the merits that was, that was contained in the complaints. And in no instance did a court find that the charges of fraud were real. And it's also worth noting that even if the Trump campaign complained that it did not have its day in court, there have been post-election reviews in each of the six battleground states that could have made a difference. And those ranged from the somewhat farcical cyber ninjas case in Arizona to the Michigan Senate report that was mentioned earlier, the hand recount in Georgia uh, that Mr. Pack addressed. And in each one of those instances, there was no credible evidence of fraud produced by the Trump campaign or his supporters. Thank you. You know, as Mr. Ginsburg has explained, there are no cases where the Trump campaign was able to convince a court that there was widespread fraud or irregularities in the 2020 election. Over and over, judges appointed by Democrats and Republicans alike directly rebuted this false narrative. They called out the Trump campaign's lack of evidence for its claims, and the judges did that even in cases where they could have simply thrown out the lawsuit without writing a word. You can see behind me a few excerpts from the decisions in these 62 cases. The Trump campaign's lack of evidence was criticized by judges across the political spectrum. In Pennsylvania, a Trump-appointed judge concluded, quote, charges require specific allegations and proof. We have neither here. Another Trump-appointed judge warned that if cases like these succeeded, quote, any disappointed loser in a presidential election 
able to hire a team of clever lawyers could flag claim deviations from election results and cast doubt on election results. The list goes on and on. Allegations are called, quote, an amalgamation of theories, conjecture, and speculation. In another, strained legal arguments without merit, unsupported by evidence, derived from wholly unreliable sources, a fundamental and obvious misreading of the Constitution. The rejection of President Trump's litigation efforts was overwhelming. 22 federal judges appointed by Republican presidents, including 10 appointed by President Trump himself, and at least 24 elected or appointed Republican state judges dismissed the president's claims. At least 11 lawyers have been referred for disciplinary proceedings due to bad faith and baseless efforts to undermine the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. Rudy Giuliani had his license to practice law suspended in New York, and just this week, a newly filed complaint will potentially make his suspension from practicing law in DC permanent. And as we've just heard from perhaps the most preeminent Republican election lawyer in recent history, the Trump campaign's unprecedented effort to overturn its election loss in court was a deeply damaging abuse of the judicial process. As stated by US District Court Judge David Carter, this was, quote, a coup in search of a legal theory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I want to thank our witnesses for joining us today. The members of the select committee may have additional questions for today's witnesses, and we ask that you respond expeditiously in writing to those questions. Without objection, members will be permitted 10 business days to submit statements for the record, including opening remarks and additional questions for the witnesses. The second panel of witnesses is now dismissed. Without objection, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman woman from California, Ms. Lofgren, for a closing statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now that we understand the litigation efforts by President Trump and his allies, I'd like to present additional actions taken by the Trump campaign during this time. President Trump continued to push the stolen election narrative, even though he and his allies knew that their litigation efforts making the same claim had failed. It's worth pointing out that litigation uh, generally does not uh, continue past the safe harbor date of December 14th. Uh, but the fact that this litigation went on, well, that decision makes more sense when you consider the Trump campaign's fundraising tactics. Because if the litigation had stopped on December 14th, there would have been no fight to defend the election and no clear path to continue to raise millions of dollars. Mr. Chairman, at this time, I'd ask for unanimous consent to include in the record a video presentation describing how President Trump used the lies he told to raise millions of dollars from the American people. These fundraising schemes were also part of the effort to, to disseminate the false claims of election fraud. Without objection, so My name is Amanda Wick, and I'm senior investigative counsel with the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. Between Election Day and January 6th, the Trump campaign sent millions of fundraising emails to Trump supporters, sometimes as many as 25 a day. The emails claimed the, quote, left-wing mob was undermining the election, implored supporters to, quote, step up to protect the integrity of the election, and encouraged them to, quote, fight back. But as the select committee has demonstrated, the Trump campaign knew these claims of voter fraud were false, yet they continued to barrage small dollar donors with emails, encouraging them to donate to something called the Official Election Defense Fund. 
The select committee discovered no such fund existed. I don't believe there is actually a fund called the Election Defense Fund. Is it fair to say the Election Defense Fund was another, as I think we've called it a marketing tactic? Yes. And tell us about these funds as marketing tactics. Uh, just a topic matter, uh, where money could potentially go to be, how money could potentially be used. The claims that the election was stolen were so successful. President Trump and his allies raised $250 million, nearly $100 million in the first week after the election. On November 9th, 2020, President Trump created a separate entity called the Save America PAC. Most of the money raised went to this newly created PAC, not to election-related litigation. The Select Committee discovered that the Save America PAC made millions of dollars of contributions to pro-Trump organizations, including $1 million to Trump Chief of Staff Mark Meadows' Charitable Foundation, $1 million to the America First Policy Institute, a conservative organization which employs several former Trump administration officials, $204,857 to the Trump Hotel Collection, and over $5 million to Event Strategies, Inc., the company that ran President Trump's January 6th rally on the ellipse. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing. The evidence developed by the Select Committee highlights how the Trump campaign aggressively pushed false election claims to fundraise, telling supporters it would be used to fight voter fraud that did not exist. The emails continued through January 6th, even as President Trump spoke on the ellipse. 30 minutes after the last fundraising email was sent, the Capitol was breached. Every American is entitled and encouraged to participate in our electoral process. Political fundraising is part of that. Small dollar donors use scarce disposable income to support candidates and causes of their choosing to make their voices heard. And those donors deserve the truth about what those funds will be used for. Throughout the committee's investigation, we found evidence that the Trump campaign and its surrogates misled donors as to where their funds would go and what they would be used for. So not only was there the big lie, there was the big ripoff. Donors deserve to know where their funds are really going. They deserve better than what President Trump and his team did. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Without objection, the chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Wyoming, Ms. Cheney, for a closing statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would uh, like to thank all of our witnesses today. Uh, and I'd also like to, uh, in particular, wish Mr. Stepien and, and his family uh, all the best uh, on the arrival of, of a new baby. Today's hearing, Mr. Chairman, was very narrowly focused. And in the coming days, you will see the committee move on to President Trump's broader planning for January 6th, including his plan to corrupt the Department of Justice, and his detailed planning with lawyer John Eastman to pressure the vice president, state legislatures, state officials, and others to overturn the election. Let me leave you today with one clip to preview what you will see in one of our hearings to come. This is the testimony of White House lawyer Eric Hirschman. John Eastman called Mr. Hirschman the day after January 6th. And here is how that conversation went. I said to him, are you out of your effing mind? I, I, said, I, I said, I only want to hear two words coming out of your mouth from now on. Orderly transition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. At the conclusion of last week's hearing, we showed you a video of rioters explaining why they had come to Washington on January 6th. It was because Donald Trump told them to be here. Today we heard about some of the lies Donald Trump embraced and amplified when it became clear he didn't have the numbers of votes to win the election. 
We heard about how officials at different levels of government explored claims of fraud and found no evidence, yet the former president continued to repeat those false claims over and over again. Today, we'll end things where we did on Thursday, back on January 6th, hearing words of individuals who wanted to stop the transfer of power. We know they were there because of Donald Trump. Now we hear some of the things they believed. Without objection, I enter into the record a video presentation. I know exactly what's going on right now. Fake election. They think they're gonna fucking cheat us out of our vote and put communist fucking Biden in office. It ain't fucking happening today, buddy. You voted? Yes, sir. How'd it go? Voted early. It went well, except for uh, the can't can't really trust the software. Dominion software all over. We voted, and right in the top right hand corner of the Dominion voting machine that we used. There was a Wi-Fi symbol with five bars. So that most definitely connected to the internet, without a doubt. So they stole that from us twice. We're not doing it anymore. We're not taking it anymore. So we're standing up, we're here, and whatever happens, we're not laying down again. It didn't work. It didn't work. It absolutely worked. It didn't work. No! Trust the system. 200,000 people that weren't even registered voted. 430,000 votes disappeared from President Trump's tally. And you can't stand there and tell me that it worked. I don't want to say that what we're doing is right. But if the election's being stolen, what is it going to take? The chair requests those in the hearing room remain seated until the Capitol Police have escorted members from the room. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned.